Bueno, sí. Ni hao. Guten Tag. <laughs> Willkommen. Uh, buenos días a todos. <laughs> en nombre del Colegio de México y de su presidente, Javier García Diego, en mi nombre personal también, les doy la bienvenida a este acto académico sobre los estudios de género en Alemania, China y México. Da mucho gusto ver uh, aquí, además de nuestros colegas mexicanos, nuestras y nuestros colegos, colegas mexicanas y mexicanos, a amigos y amigas de Alemania y China, Corea también, incluyo también a Corea. El uh, tema de los estudios de género que se discutirá uh, aquí durante dos días es y ha sido de gran interés para el Colegio de México. No necesito recordar que hace más de 30 años, en 1983, para ser más preciso, se creó aquí el Programa Interdisciplinario de Estudios de la Mujer, en un contexto en el cual se estaban iniciando los trabajos de investigación sobre ese tema en el país. Y más allá de su uh, acción pionera, cabe resaltar que las colegas del PIEM han hecho contribuciones fundamentales para el desarrollo y la consolidación de los estudios de género en el país, y tanto desde la trinchera de la investigación y de la do docencia, como también desde el, lo que yo llamaría el activismo intelectual, la concientización, el trabajo de poner en la agenda pública el tema eh, de, del género. Me parece fascinante que hoy eh, podamos comparar la labor realizada en general en México con lo que se hace en Alemania y China. El tema de la equidad de género sigue siendo un tema fundamental en nuestras sociedades contemporáneas y eso se puede afirmar eh, en todas las tribunas, más allá de lo que se hace, por ejemplo, en la entrega de los Oscars y todo esto en el cine. Cuando uno examina el programa de este acto académico, no puede sino estar impresionado por el número, la diversidad y la calidad de las y los participantes. Por ello, quiero de entrada hacer un reconocimiento público a las organizadoras alemanas, chinas y mexicanas. También, también y ahora lo estábamos comentando en eh, nuestras conversaciones eh, iniciales informales, también quisiera mencionar el carácter internacional eh, de la iniciativa. Eh, para la pequeña historia, este, este encuentro nació a raíz de una sugerencia de nuestras colegas eh, alemanas que ya tenían vínculos con nuestras colegas chinas. Desde hace años tenemos una estrecha relación de colaboración con la Universidad Libre de Berlín. Tenemos uh, desde hace como seis años un colegio internacional de graduados que trabaja el tema uh, de, las, uh, de la globalización desde la perspectiva espacial. Tenemos uh, un flujo importante de movilidad estudiantil y de profesores con dicha universidad y tenemos también investigaciones eh, comunes. También desde hace muchos años tenemos relaciones de colaboración con la Universidad de Beijing. Hace más de 50 años que se estudia y se enseña sobre China en el Colegio de México. Y no solo eso, veía que aquí estaba presente la profesora Flora Botón, no solo se estudia y se enseña sobre China, sino que desde hace muchos años se ha hecho investigación sobre eh, en estudios de género eh, en China desde, eh, desde México. Eh, 
Existe también, tenemos un convenio de colaboración con la Universidad de Beijing, que se firmó hace algunos años, para formalizar relaciones bilaterales que existían desde hace mucho tiempo. Tenemos una cátedra, el Colegio de México, de Estudios Mexicanos en la, estu en la Universidad de Beijing, que permite a un profesor del colegio ir a, o una profesora ir a hablar de temas mexicanos. Me da mucho gusto saludar a la delegación de profesores y profesoras de la Universidad de Beijing. Aquí está el profesor Dong Jingsheng, que dirige el programa de estudios latinoamericanos de la Universidad de Beijing. Y, uh, y lo que me parece fantástico es que de esas dos relaciones que para nosotros hasta hace muy poco eran relaciones bilaterales paralelas, pero que no eh, coincidían en sus intereses de, uh, de investigación. Entonces, me parece fantástico que de esas dos relaciones paralelas de colaboración, que esas dos relaciones puedan converger en la organización de este acto académico en torno a un tema que es, sin lugar a dudas, de importancia universal. Entonces, por lo tanto, les deseo un muy provechoso intercambio de ideas y uh, formulo el voto que sea solo el inicio de una larga colaboración trilateral en el campo de los estudios de género y también uh, en otros campos de las ciencias sociales y humanas en general. Enhorabuena. Bien, cedo la palabra a la profesora Karin Tina. Ah, ok, perfecto, es que ahí en el orden me indicaba que hablaba Karin. Entonces, le doy la palabra a la profesora eh, Brigitta Schutt, Schutt, que es la vicepresidencia de la Freie Universität en Berlín. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jean-François. Dear colleagues, um, Freie Universität and the Colegio de Mexico have uh, at least a decades-old relationship which has been strengthened more and more in the last years. And, um, well, one of the, the, or not, not one of the, the strong partner in this game from side of the Freie Universität Berlin is, of course, the Latin America Institute, uh, where we have all these uh, strong social sciences which are doing a lot of research also in, in Mexico. And not only in Mexico, but a lot of that in Mexico. And uh, I think... In social sciences, it is understood that um, you cannot do social sciences without gender studies. And so, it, in a way, it was obvious that, that there was a program coming up uh, where a focus was done on that objective. And, well, in Mexico, the Colegio is the strong, or well, it is at least one of the top players in research, and uh, maybe even the top player, as you don't have that much teaching load as other universities, as I learned, you lucky guys. <laughs> and uh, in, in Germany, uh, also Freie Universität is very proud to say that, that we belong to the very strong universities, and especially in, in the humanities and social sciences, we are very strong. And so it was obvious that in a way uh, that, that was put up and um, we came together and then I think it was last year when you had that conference in China and I think there the idea was born to come together in, uh, in Mexico because uh, it was not only a conference in China but you realized that the partners, the Colegio and also the UNAM on the Mexican side and on the German side, the Freie Universität are having are the same. Yeah, because there's uh, the beta and uh, there are the, the Korean universities we are cooperating with and uh, they have also ties with Mexico and ties to each other and so 
it got really obvious to come together in Mexico and, and to, to uh, have this event. And uh, to be honest, I believe this, in, in a way, uh, it is the future to go into these strong international networks where you always find the same strong players. And uh, I think that is also an experience we exchanged uh, half an hour before. You always find the same players uh, wherever you go. And uh, the, the tides of Freie Universität are, of, with Beda are very strong in, in various levels. The same with uh, the different Korean universities we tied together in the Korea net because you have a have a very diverse but very strong uh, network there and in, in Mexico City uh, it, it are at least the Colegio, Colegio Mexico and uh, the UNAM we are cooperating with and uh, so in a way this meeting here is an obvious consequence but anyhow um, I think it was uh, very challenging to organize this yeah, uh, because the more partners, usually the more partners you get, uh, the, the more difficult it is getting. And I know from my position at Freie Pol uh, Universität Berlin that it is also very important that there is somebody in the back who is backing up. And I know that Jean-Francois uh, was, was the one uh, doing that here at the Colegio de Mexico, and, and therefore I, I want to thank you also in the name of the scientists and the, the organizers being directly involved in this meeting. But I also know that uh, there are, well, people like Jean-Francois Jean, Jean and me, we are usually giving the backup and doing the signatures. But uh, some, some people have to do the groundwork. And uh, I, <laughs> that's the way, well, we, we call it in Germany, we, we make it a uh, euphemism and, and we call it Arbeitsebene. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I know that Karin uh, was, was one of the persons who was, uh, very ambitious in, in the organization from the Mexican side, and I want to thank you for that. And uh, I, I also know that from the German side, uh, Marta, uh, Marta Zapata uh, was the one really pushing and driving it. And I know also that, uh, that you were not alone, but there were always some helping and assisting hands behind, and uh, these are from both sides, from the Mexican and the German side, and this were Teresa Orozco, and this were uh, Jimena Alba and Karina Esparanza, uh, Esparza, not Esparanza, sorry, Esparza. And uh, I, I want to thank you also for that because uh, usually a meeting like this is nothing one person alone can organize. You need somebody who takes the responsibilities and who really do the job, but you need a lot of assistance. And this is a teamwork which we have here. And uh, also in the name of the Freie Universität, I want to thank you for that. Uh, well, finally, there are also some, some uh, leading scientists behind that. And there, of course, that is Marianne Breik, um, which uh, I, I think, I, I'm not sure, but I think something she's like you, Francoise. Uh, um, he is, she is, well, I learned he is, is having a double, um, uh, what, what do you call it? She, he's Canadian and Mexican, so in Germany it is not allowed, but I think uh, if Marianne could do it, she would like to be German and Mexican. But the Germans are not allowed uh, to, to have uh, two, two passports. And uh, this then also, of course, we have our colleague from Freie Universität Mechtel Leutner, uh, who is uh, having, well, I think she is from the Freie Universität, the one who is uh, carrying the partnership with the Beida, and she is very sorry that she cannot be here, but uh, I think also her, her impulses were um, very important. And then, of course, uh, Professor Chang from the, Chang Yang from the uh, Beida University, uh, you took a very important role in, in giving impulses here, and I, I thank you for that. And um, I wish you have some very fruitful discussions here, and I hope that this is not the last meeting of that kind. Uh, you are allowed to organize. Thank you very much. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Brigitte. 
Jean-François, muy buenos días. En, en nombre del Programa Interdisciplinario de Estudios de la Mujer, eh, les doy la bienvenida en el marco de este coloquio que hemos titulado eh, Estudios de Género en Alemania, China y México, Avances en la Equidad. Fundado en 1983, como lo recordó Jean-François, y pionero en la institucionalización de los estudios de género en el país, el Programa Interdisciplinario de Estudios de la Mujer, que llamamos PIEM por sus siglas, tiene una historia marcada por una labor ejemplar a nivel de la formación académica y de la investigación. Entre sus múltiples actividades destacan las de la maestría en estudios de género, el curso de verano, mesas redondas y encuentros académicos sobre diversas problemáticas de género. En más de 30 años, el PIEM ha publicado más de 70 libros y no piensa bajar el ritmo. Voy un poco lento porque sé que aquí me están traduciendo. ¿eh? A tres días del, de la celebración del Día Internacional de las Mujeres, nos regocijamos en el PIEM de recibir a distinguidos, distinguidas colegas alemanes, alemanas, chinos, chinas e, e incluso una colega coreana, dos, ah, perdón, One and a half. <risa> dos, dos colegas coreanas eh, para eh, reflexionar desde nuestros propios contextos socioculturales sobre los avances, o no, depende, en términos de equidad de género. Para llevar a cabo esta tarea, nos, propus, nos propusimos plantear distintos ejes de reflexión, tales como la globalización del género a través de los medios de comunicación y prácticas culturales, la desigualdad social y la cuestión de la transversalización, las dinámicas migratorias y diásporas, el prisma del cuerpo y las sexualidades, la historia de movimientos y pensamientos feministas desde los años 70 hasta hoy en día. Alemania, China, Corea y México, cuatro países, cuatro velocidades y muchísimas maneras de observar y abordar los avances en la equidad de género. Como lo acabo de mencionar, en el PIEM siempre estamos dispuestas a publicar nuestras investigaciones y este encuentro académico internacional podría dar lugar a una publicación colectiva. También aprovecho la ocasión para anunciar que en el Centro de Estudios Sociológicos y el PIEM, inauguramos en enero pasado una revista electrónica llamada Estudios de Género en el Colegio de, de, el Colegio de México y se encuentra en www.estudiosdegénero.colmex.mx. Todo el año recibimos eh, textos para publicar y serán bienvenidas las contribuciones presentadas en este encuentro y convertidas en artículos de investigación. Bueno, me regocijo de este encuentro, al igual que mis colegas, de este encuentro y de este, esta gran operación de compartir, que es un poco excepcional, ¿no? reunir… Eh, pues eh, países, eh, colegas desde países desde tan lejos. ¿no? Y para no hacer más larga esta introducción, voy a pasar a los agradecimientos porque sí son muchos. Este evento no hubiera sido posible sin el apoyo a nivel institucional de la Universidad Libre de Berlín, de la Universidad de Pekín, así como de la EWA Women's University, 
de Corea del Sur, además del apoyo del Colegio de México. A nivel individual, agradezco muchísimo a la doctora Marta Zapata, quien ha coordinado y coorganizado este encuentro, tendiendo magníficamente los puentes entre, entre todos los participantes. ¿no? Agradezco a los y las ponentes y moderadores de este coloquio, venidos desde la otra punta del mundo, como decía Lil Hanna, es que no te das cuenta, es que vienen desde muy lejos. Y agradezco esto, que han venido desde la otra punta del mundo, o también diría desde la otra punta de la ciudad, porque también es un esfuerzo cruzar México, City. Mis sinceros agradecimientos van a Josefina Recías y Luz del Carmen Zambrano por la logística del evento. A los traductores que están aquí escondidos, se puede desde ahora agradecerlos por el enorme trabajo que les espera. Agradezco al público por su presencia. Podremos dar constancias de asistencia a las personas que lo requieren. ¿no? Y por último, les deseo disfrutar, porque ante todo, estos encuentros académicos se deben disfrutar, porque son grandes momentos de reflexiones e intercambios académicos que promete ser muy fructífero y productivo. Gracias. Ahora nos vamos a retirar y eh, vamos a empezar este encuentro con una primera mesa, eh, justamente coordinada por eh, Marta Zapata y eh, cuyo eje articulador es Globalizando al Género, Conocimientos, Medios y Prácticas Culturales. Eh, por esta primera sesión que vamos a tener, esta primera mesa, sobre que vamos a trabajar el tema globalizando al género, conocimientos, medios y prácticas culturales. Y en esta mesa, como tienen ya en el programa, participan eh, tres eh, ponentes de la Freie Universität Berlin. Vamos a iniciar con Annette Tipner. Después seguimos con Margaret Lunenburg y terminamos, cerramos con Marianne Bray. Eh, lo que vamos a hacer por cuestión de tiempos es que vamos a escuchar las tres ponencias, vamos a tratar de cuidar los tiempos y al término vamos a tener eh, un tiempo para hacer preguntas y para la discusión. Bueno, me gustaría decir algo primero acerca de Annette eh, Tipner. Ella acaba de concluir sus estudios de doctorado sobre cómo la transformación de las identidades y las tecnologías eh, de un término que es muy difícil de traducir al español, el self, el self, del, digamos, el selbst en alemán. Eh, digamos, está trabajando un poco cómo están cambiando estas identidades eh, y las tecnologías del, del, de lo propio, del, de la mismidad. Eh, precisamente en el contexto de la segunda modernidad en China, eh, en la Universidad Libre de Berlín, está trabajando, tenemos un instituto de estudios sobre Asia y en este contexto hizo, hizo su trabajo. El fenómeno que ella estudia eh, es los fenómenos que trabaja sobre la, la China urbana y le interesa sobre todo trabajar sobre jóvenes y el consumo de la cultura, de las, las clases medias, la urbanización… Eh, y también eh, relaciones culturales, eh, medios, estudios de género. Entonces, eh, le damos la bienvenida a Annette Tipner y esperamos pues, eh, que en 20 minutos podamos presentar a la siguiente ponente. Gracias. Yeah. 
Yeah. So thank you very much for the invitation here. It's a really great opportunity to be here and learn more about the Mexican perspective. So, muchos gracias. <laughs> and as I'm working on China studies, so you already heard, I'd like to introdu introduce you to, uh, some of my recent. Yeah? Okay. okay. Um, so, today I'd like to introduce you, introduce you some of my recent research uh, results concerning uh, relationship and love concepts and marriage and uh, intimacy in today China. Um, so, even in today's China, marriage, marriage still takes an important role as social rite passage in personal life. Although pre-material relationships and even sexual experiences are now not uncommon, the ultimate goal of every couple's relationship still remains fixed on the achievement of marriage. <laughs> in fact, in China, only 1.3% of men and 4.2% of women aged over 30 are not married. So, we can ask, what are the motives that everyone strives towards marriage so eagerly in China? And how are the discourses about marriage and popular concepts of love in relationships are linked together? Generally, since the 1990s, there's a wide acceptance of the principle of first falling in love and then marry, or in Chinese, xian tan lian ai ho jie hun, which replaced the inverted maxim of the socialists in early reform era, and a marriage without love would be now these days seen as by the majority of people as immoral. But love in China is still mainly result-driven and does not find its fulfillment in the process of itself like it is in the West. So China's most famous researcher on love and relationship, Li and He, defines the marriage pressure as a specifically social cultural generated Chinese phenomena. She says, in China all people have to marry. No one asks why, no one knows why, but there is a saying, when men grow up they have to marry, and when women grow up they are married. Um, as there is no other choice. And even if the marriage age exceeds the average slightly of two or three years, there will be immediately all kinds of suspicions and whispers and bring the poor unmarried person grief and annoyance. The importance of marriage to personal and social identity, especially for women, can be examined by those who are so unlucky not to find a partner within their proof time frame. Women who are not married until the age of 30 are called remnants or old maids or in Chinese shengnu and are standing under general suspicion of blatant deficits in character and personhood that had driven away any potential suitors. These old maids are stigmatized as abnormal in public discourses and are skeptical eyed by society because the failure of marriage is assumed to be their own fault. To escape this horror version of becoming an old maid, it is important for women to be active in early, at early stage. A quote from a Chinese woman counselor book brings it to the point. It says, who is not thinking about marriage at the age of 23 may end up as old maid. In fact, in the most guidebooks, uh, in the, most guidebooks uh, the appropriate age for marriage for women is set between 21 and 25 years. This period is justified by various factors, such as the most potential male candidates who are on the partner market in this age period, and with the growing age, all good matches are already snatched away, and only losers are left. Other studies explain the relatively narrow age of women at marriage with the effect that men, when seeking a partner, are looking downwards in social status, wealth, and age. So as the average marriage age of men is 25.8 years, it's hard for a woman over 26 years to find a partner who is still willing to accept her. As a result, marriage appears not in the romantic light of a reunion of love, but rather as a necessary deal in life, like buying a car or an apartment that must be addressed for purely, purely social reasons and try to gain best conditions. Therefore, it is not surprising that seeking a partner is often a very calculated and pragmatic choice. As a kind of rational social risk minimization, feelings and individual appeal are more or less dispensable in the process. Or like a, a woman counselor book puts it metaphorically to a, in the nutshell, no one wants to go to the vegetable market and carry a rotten watermelon home. When choosing a husband, it is the same. This is a quote from the council book. So candidates are therefore systematically checked and selected until in the end one man is luckily left who meets all criteria on the checklist, which are mainly a secure income, good career prospects, certain material conditions such as housing and car, a respectable family background and a sense of responsibility for the family. This review of potential candidates 
um, according to rational criteria and the selection on basis of economic calculations, leads to an increasingly utilitarian attitude towards the relationship in marriage. That the idea of marriage out of pure love is becoming less important results from two, two dilemmas. First, the assumption that economic and social requirements are playing an equally or even more important role in marriage as emotions. Second, that love without reasonable economic conditions could not lead to a happy marriage. Indeed, love could not exist without appropriate economic conditions. Instead, questions of personality and emotional harmony are not even discussed. Feelings seem even misleading when finding a marriage partner, as many tragic stories in magazines, internet forums, and guidebooks show us. The bad boy and the wrong partner do not lack sincere love and devotion, but mostly the necessary economic requirement. Pure feelings as a basis of a relationship are apparently generally mistrusted. So a Chinese woman in an interview says, love and marriage don't have to go together. Sometimes I think love can be beautiful and romantic, but marriage must be very realistic. Of course, if love and marriage can be unified completely, it is a rare gift from the gods and want to be cherished. However, such ideal marriages are rare as hands tease. So this was a quote. So it seems that in China, a skeptical attitude toward, towards marriage as expression of love is growing. Love and marriage don't have obviously not, does not have obviously not have necessarily go along with, it, with each other, but sometimes even strive towards diametrical directions. Yet for all the pragmatics, a romantic idea behind the Chinese marriage and love discourse is not entirely absent. On the contrary, the dilemma um, of, of Chinese women in maid choice arises just from the parallelism of a strong romantic vision of love on the one hand and the pragmatic considerations of economic benefits on the other. While since the 1980s, an ideal of individualistic love is increasingly established, the invasion of the logic of market eco economy into the private sphere demand for a strong orientation towards economically pragmatic factors. But love does not always just fall on the candidate with the best economic conditions. Therefore, controversial narratives about liberal individualistic concepts of love and romance on the one side and the tra traditional occupation of femininity with economic exchange value on the other are becoming one of the big obstacles in couples' relationship in China today. Principally, the ideas of the so-called romantic love, how they were constructed and distributed through the 19th and 20th century in Western media as a revision of the original 18th century concept, are not a new phenomenon in China. The ideal of love, based on a purely intellectual and emotional connection beyond all social implications, has been used as a symbolic weapon in the iconoclastic revolution against Confucian patriarchy and social restriction of traditional Chinese society during the May Force movement in Republican China. In the Thomas arrangement between nature and the Confucian culture, it is called for liberation from outdated social normatives and restrictions by the enlightening structure of love. Because it triggers emotions in a naturally inherent moral reasoning in the individual, love promotes the ability to combine noble intentions and concrete actions to true be virtuous behavior. At the same time, love creates individuality and autonomy through the liberation from social and economic structures. Thus, free marriage and love became in intellectual circles and a symbol of resistance and a break with tradition and localism in favor for a cosmopolitan community and a spirit of modernity. This trend of idealizing love as a symbol of resistance and opposition even continues in postmodern times. Although the opposition nowadays no longer represents the counterpart of the dehumanizing dogmas of Confucianism or socialism, but with the increasing capitalization of all areas of life, serves as a symbol of the, for the humanistic attitude beyond any e economic calculations. So if we, if we are talking about romantic love in Chinese popular discourse today, it does not resort to the concept of romantic love in Europe in the 18th or 19th century. Although the new understanding of romantic love in China is repeatedly associated with terms such as modern, progressive, and Western, but it is less really based on an actual Western love concept, but can be rather be considered as a recontextualization of historical and global processes. Besides, besides principles of individualism, self-realization, and gender equality, the Chinese interpretation of the concept of romantic love also includes a symbolic status of individual and a program opposed to ideology. 
It is, to put it with Durkheim, in the process of social modernization, the central space of experience and utopia beyond the ordinary, and simultaneously established in a status of, as a symbol of the dreams, hopes, and aspirations of the young generation. Or as James Farah, a researcher on Chinese youth culture, states it, in reform era China, romantic feeling has, to, has come to represent the authentic human value opposed to the worship of money, but also endangered by it. Though this danger, he mentions, is mainly found in the commodification of intimate relationships to economic values through a process which Eva Illus describes as the consumption of romance. A reification of romance in which romantic practices are increasingly determined by consumer behavior that leads to an associated fetishization of consumption and romance. These are effects of the so-called emotional capitalism, an interpenetration of emotions in economic cost-benefit calculus in postmodern capitalism. The economic capitalism is a culture in which emotional and economic discourses and practices shape each, each other and create a broad movement that, on the one hand, makes emotions an essential part of economic behavior, and on the other hand, also subordinates emotional life to structures and logic of economic relations and exchange process. So, to face on, on the Chinese example, you don't simply have a love relationship, it has to be economically useful. As a saying which became popular in recent years proves, it says, rather cry in a BMW than love on a bicycle. In this new economy of pleasure, which also increases parallel to China's economic growth, several factors must be met and weighed against each other to achieve a desired profit. On the one hand, there is an individual satisfaction Satisfaction, on the other hand, the, mod the commodification of sexual and emotional actions for achieving and stabilizing social and economic posi positions plays an increasingly important role in behavior. So, for example, you see pretty women on the street either with old men or foreigners because both are assumed to be prosper. And many men are resigned that you will not be respected if you don't give the girls money or even brag proudly that the women love them just for their money. A man tells us about his experience uh, with, a mainly, with the mainly pragmatic considerations of women in choice of their partners. He says, when she spoke to me the first time, it was only of, from loneliness. That was also the reason when she called me after a week. But when I drove up with my experienced luxury car to pick her up, she suddenly thought that that would, pro pro would be probably a person to marry. She knows that I like her, but she cherishes towards me no feelings at all. Just because I have money, she probably thought if she may have to marry someone at all, then at least someone with money, so she don't have to worry about anything in the future and can buy herself pleasures. And this was a quote. This example manifests the utilitarian attitude of women in made choice, especially in the stage of dating. In dating, a similar process of commercialization took place in the 1980s in China, like in Europe and the US in the 50s and 60s. While in socialist China, courtship happened beyond commercial implications and feelings were expressed in immaterial practices such as writing letters or taking a walk in the park together or visits at each other's family, the modern dating culture is mainly characterized through a use of consumption practices and commercial leisure facilities, including cinemas, restaurants, and shopping centers. So dating always is accompanied by a high financial commitment. The inclusion of consumer culture as part of the romantic performance results in the fact that obtaining the attention of the opposite sex is especially for men associated with high financial investment. For example, a young Chinese man acquired international media attention as he rented all Cineplex cinemas in Beijing at once as a late refutation for his ex-girlfriend who had left him because he couldn't invite her, her to the movie then. The media discourse in China pro promotes this development as a positive sign. They even advise the women to check the seriousness of the intentions of the candidate to their, to, to, to their financial generosity. Who gives roses is looking for just a short pleasure. Who gives a diamond ring has further interests. But only those who give a diamond bracelet from Tiffany are interested in a serious relationship. Though it's the logic of the stock market. The more the man invests in a woman, the less he's willing to separate from her. Because in this case, he will lose all his investments in time, energy, and money. A case story reports us about a young emancipated white collar woman standing economically on her own feet and therefore do not want to build a relationship on financial disparity. That is why she rejects expensive gifts from her boyfriend and always pays half of the costs of joint activities. 
In the end, however, she's abandoned by her boyfriend because with her insistence on financial independence, she refused to give him a confirmation of his econ economically measured male potency and prowess, and he could have turned apart without any regrets because she had cost him nothing. That's why women always should ask for expensive presents and plan dating activities within the frames of consumer culture in order to test his commitment. Hence, consumption takes a high priority in the rituals for stabi stabilizing relationships because they affiliate the rhetoric of male power and prowess in comparison to female value, female value and thus give financial and material components and emotional meaning. As a sign of social and economic power, there is a romantic game called the economy of waste in which feelings are measured by how much you motivate the other person to spend his fortune for you. The story of a man illustrates it. The young man got to know a woman on his trip to Western China. They fell in love head over heels, spent several days with each other, joining all pleasures of romantic consumer culture, and after two weeks, they decide to marry. Um, then the young bride wants to continue the overwhelming um, living, standard of living from these first days of being in love. It was a kind of consumerist frenzy of romance, including exclusive shopping trips and culinary delights and all kinds of leisure culture. When after three months, the man's entire assets were completely, completely used up, the woman asked for divorce without batting an eye. In this example, we can recognize that material objects are sent to the primary connection between the sexes. Although the romantic practices of consumption are often embedded in rituals which try to cross the border between pure material value and individuality by giving objects an extra value on the meta level, yet these semantics of romantic love ultimately remain limited to practices of consumer culture and are induced by it. Though without a consumerist context, a love is literally not visible and therefore cannot be experienced. Instead, there's a kind of dominance of hyper-rationality, which means that the economic cost-benefit calculus penetrates the in intimate relationship as far as the emotional component is sometimes com completely suppressed. But in contrast to this devaluation of romantic ideas through the reification of love when it is set against, of, against economic benefits, there, is an increasingly, there are increasingly voices that argue for a less utilitarian and more humanistic orientation in intimate relationships. Similarly to the new Romance discourse in the West in the aftermath of the uh, 1968 movement, in China the importance and the value of emotional experience is gradually returning, especially against the backdrop of economic fluctuations, rapid social changes and a feeling of insecurity. Coincidencing with the ubiquitous exhortations in public discourse to make intersexual relations economically useful, there is also a new discourse establishing at its margins which ad advocate for a new appreciation of feelings as a source of authenticity and purity and condemns the involvement of calculus and profit. Because after getting rich is glorious, no matter how, becomes an established motive in behavior in China, a compensatory rhetoric of romantic individualism has become a dominant language of morale and critique. So the agents of the post-80s generation, especially the new urban well-off youth and intellectual circles, aim for neoliberal values and a maximum of relevance of love. They develop their own ways of resistance, with new models of relationships like the blind wedding or the internet wedding or the naked wedding, economic factors are either excluded completely or at least regulated to the periphery of relationship, and the pragmatic cost-benefit calculations gives way to the true recognition of the self and the other as it is stated in the concept of romantic love in the West too. Actually, if we, took, if we take a look in Chinese women's magazines, films, or internet forums, romantic scenarios are ubiquitous. Lonely meetings in the rain, or farewell kisses on bridges, passionate encounters with strangers. All these members of the new petite bourgeoisie, or xiaozi in Chinese, in China, urban, <coughs> urban zenders are celebrating love and romance as one kind of their new lifestyle of indulgence and individuality. Their visions of romance are share a connection between emotion and excitement, tension and conflict. In short, the extraordinary. Um, romantic scenarios appear to be a counter-proposal to normal normality, an orchestration between ritual and play beyond the everyday experience. Therefore, James Ferrer speaks of aesthetication of romance, because especially the female expectations on men staging romance are high. It must be something surprising, something unexpected, which, which is connected to great efforts and moves to tears. In times where everything is measured in material goods, 
common flowers or dinner invitations or small gifts are too mundane and ordinary. So romance has to be primarily a good story, a dramatic performance, which is constructed and gets its meaning in the interpersonal narration. So today's romantic love concept reminds us partly of that of the times in the Republican era, where narratives of free love serve primarily as symbols of one's individuality in the contrast to filial and social normatives, and therefore the symbolic act of so the performance and the orchestration of romance was in the focus. Then as now, the initiative character of, romance, of the romantic act is in the foreground, while the realization of a long-term relationship is secondary. Failed and tragic relationships are transformed into, legend, into legendary romantic myth, whereas successful relationships are quickly, quickly delivered to the fate of boredom. Love is as long or as romantic as it is uncertain in all aspects. But this attitude re represents a diametric opposite between the pure notion, notions of love and the concrete manifestations of ma in marriage, because the latter is first and foremost characterized by social and economic security in all areas, and therefore often felt as very disappointing and unromantic. This strengthens the belief in the incompatibility of love and marriage, which fuels the trend towards utilitarian decisions. If love is anyway ephemeral, vain, and very difficult to integrate into so normal social life, it makes more sense to focus on stable factors such as economic hedges. And so love will face the same fate as other ethical key ideas in the process of their profound realization. Due to the incompatibility between practice and theory, the idea survives only as utopian ideal, while the reality of life is determined by pragmatic factors. So it is probably precisely this dissonant combination of romantic utopia on the one side and the everyday social norm and Chinese public discourse on love and relationship which produces a general headache on relationship. On the one hand, love is appointed to be a driving force for transcendence from everyday life and give meaning. On the other hand, romantic ideals fail in their realization on the social standard on compulsive marriage. This increasingly leads to the dissociation of love and marriage and ends up, at worst, in a de detached attitude toward, of, toward, towards both. So, thank you for your attention. Bueno, muchas gracias por esta presentación. Eh, pasamos ahora a la presentación de Margaret Lunenburg. Ella es profesora eh, de periodismo, de los estudios, en los estudios de periodismo, o en Alemania hablamos de ciencias de la comunicación, eh, en el Instituto de Medios y, Comunica y Estudios de Medios y Comunicación de la Freie Universität Berlin. Ella también es director de un centro que promueve los estudios de género y también es, eh, dirige el Centro Interdisciplinario de Investigación sobre Género en la Freie Universität de Berlín. Ella también es miembro del de, eh, Consejo Editorial de la revista Feminist Media Studies y es coeditora de eh, una serie eh, de libros sobre Critical Media Studies. Eh, su investigación eh, se concentra en los campos de género, eh, los medio y géneros, estudios género, de género y medios, eh, medios populares, eh, estudios de periodismo comparado. Eh, algunas de sus publicaciones eh, importantes eh, son, eh, junto con eh, Tania Mayer, Power Politician or Fighting Bureaucrat, Gender and Power in German Political Coverage, eh, también con eh, Fürsich Elfriede publicó Media and the Intersectional Other, The Complex Negotiation of Migration, Gender and Class on German Television. Y también tiene otra publicación con Tania Mayer sobre Gender Media Studies, una introducción eh, precisamente al tema. Bueno, muchas gracias y les cedo la palabra. Thank you, Marta, for this nice introduction. Hello, dear colleagues. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and to exchange our ideas. As a media and communication studies uh, scholar, first I need pictures. I hope you enjoy it a little bit to give some impressions into the fields of research. And I decided to offer some insights in my current research 
on the relevance of media in globalizing ideas of gender and globalizing patterns of gender. So let me start with some very general remarks on the role of media towards society. Media do not at all reflect reality or open up a window to the world as some well, uh, phrases suggest us. Media construct reality on their own via narrative and visual patterns, via modes of selection and professional forms of representation. When looking at processes of transnational and transcultural developments, mobilities of people, goods, money, or ideas, as Uri and Creswell put it, media historically have had a really crucial role in making these mobilities work. By bringing the distant world into our homes, and um, by well, making us aware of the world outside, they well, are partly actor, medium, and source of globalization themselves. In current digitalized uh, environments, we use the term of, of mediatization to describe a development, I think all of us know ourselves, of the in irresolvable in interlinked uh, role of media into our everyday lives as well as in parts of society as politics or economics, relying on the logics of media. So living in a media-saturated world means the way we make sense of these worlds are at least mainly related to media and media discourse. They are initiated and structured by media. Media, I would argue, are constitutive for creating belonging to society. That's what I call, together with a colleague, cultural citizenship, as a dimension of, well, feeling as a citizen that goes beyond political and social dimensions. If we describe our societies as highly mediatized societies, media have a crucial function in defining who's inside and who's outside of this community imagined as a national society. So media deliver concepts and restrictions of inclusion and exclusion. They decide about relevance and partly construct collective identities of groups. If we think about the production and circulation of gender images in transnational and transcultural contexts, um, I think the media offer specific insights into these modes of cultural governance that is done via gender. It is my colleague, Radha Hekte, US-based media scholar uh, with origins from Indian, who argues in her book, Circuits of Visibility, I quote, you can read it here, transnational media environments serve as a crucial site from which to examine gendered constructions and contradictions that underwrite globalization. She argues that the gendered body and its visibility in and by media is used as a means to establish and assure global asymmetries and inequalities. In my presentation, I, would, I decided to give two examples out of fields of my research to go into depth into these uh, general issues. The first one, uh, is referring to the media representation of migrants, women migrants, in German media. So the media in detail might not be that relevant for you, but I think it's some um, well, insight into how in a Western society the high percentage of migrants are represented and discussed in the media. The other uh, example is a quite uh, popular one, the global circulation of uh, the of gender images in top model, I think well known all over the world. So in the first example, um, it is uh, mostly dealing with journalism, uh, covering migration and migrant women, uh, the audience is mostly conceptualized as citizens, and the discourse in media seems to be the relevant essence for, well, working democracy. So we need to have uh, the issue, issues discussed there to be able to act as citizens. While in the other example, the audience is more, well, conceptualized as consumers, not being very close to politics, but just interested in, well, lifestyle and consumerism. I will question this dichotomous distinction, and I think uh, 
Hopefully you can follow me with this questioning. Without going into too many empirical details, I will show some main findings. So let's start with the first issue, just a very short background. In Germany we have about 17 million people with migration background. As it is declared officially, this means they do not necessarily have migrated into uh, the German um, country themselves, but their parents or grandparents, nevertheless, they are not claimed to be, well, natural Germans, but having a migration background. This is um, uh, almost a fifth of uh, the whole society, so an important part um, of, of German society today. We know from several um, uh, forms of uh, content analysis of the media, not focusing in detail on gender issues, but on the representation of migration generally, that we have a very negatively ba uh, biased uh, image of migrants. So they are uh, stereotyped as the aggressive and the criminal, partly being, well, uh, at least uh, we need to be afraid of um, seeing them as terrorists or potential terrorists. So this is a knowledge we do have out of several types of media content analysis, but they are not at all focusing on gender issues. So we decided to focus explicitly on the way women migrants are, um, are represented in the media. We did this in a set of uh, five newspapers. You don't need to know them in details. We included local ones as well as national ones, traditional quality papers, as well as the tabloid paper, Bild Zeitung, the most um, well, heavily read in Germany. We decided to um, catch a month out of several years to, comp to compare them and to see whether there is some uh, development in between and combine quantitative and qualitative analysis by a coding system. And I just would like to give some insights into um, the, the results of this um, uh, research. So we identified six types of uh, female migrants that are visible in the media. The first one is the celebrity. She's a prominent uh, woman either in politics but most uh, often in, in popular culture, in music, um, being um, on the stage, so to say. So especially in the popular press, in the tabloids, they are quite uh, visible but quite often sexualized, as you can see here. The successful one is a professional woman. Here it's a professor, a literature professor, acting out intensively, so shown as a competent professional woman uh, in her field, wherever it is. The third type is the girl next door, we called it. So the everyday woman, quite well, it's not that important that she has migration background, but she's just shown as one of us. The fourth one, um, the victim, being victim either of violence in her culture or partly with victim of the gym system, um, uh, so a quite negatively biased image. And uh, the needy, she's in need of some support, especially of learning German language, of getting better education, so she's not enough the way she is. And last, the undesirable. So she's um, uh, ethic ethically questionable in the way she behaves and partly represented as a criminal one. So you may imagine on your own how often these different types become visible. I give just short insights. So you see here that the most often visible type is the victim. Maybe not really uh, unexpected, but to us it was a quite, well, frustrating result to have her most often being visible in the gym press. Next type is the celebrity, really often being visible in the tabloids on the front page um, as the exotic, the sexualized uh, woman to pose there. And the least often type is the undesirable. So if you remind my first introduction into content analysis we have on migration representation generally, the aggressive, uh, the, the, the well, potentially terrorist male migrant, we have very few images of women in that type. The contrasting part to the, the aggressive male one is the victimized female one. She seems to be somehow the complementary part, gym society being responsible for taking care of her as she's victim of her own culture, partly. 
So for me as journalism research, it is interesting to look into more details. Where do we find which type of representation? So if we compare the local pages and the political news, we argue in journalism studies regularly that it's the political news that is the core of democracy. So it's the normatively the most important field. But unfortunately, it's the most stereotyped field. There we find most often the victimized uh, migrant women. So we don't see individuals, we see somehow anonymous groups being, well, victim of some kind of um, uh, sexual harassment or violence, quite often violence um, uh, in, in their everyday life. Um, on the other side, um, the girl next door is much more visible on the local pages. So the nearer you go to the people you're reporting about, you, the more variety you do identify. The more distant you are, the more stereotyped are the images. If we compare tabloid papers and quality papers, quality papers, well, being of some quality, at least recommending to do so, it's quite poor what we see. The most positive image is the celebrity most often being visible in the tabloid. But we have to be aware that the sexualization of this type is really strong. So it's not that positive, uh, at least to my interpretation. But on the other side, the victim and the needy person is most often visible in quality papers. So if I try to conclude these um, results, I will argue that it's worthwhile to, to use an intersectional analytic perspective to identify the relation of gender and ethnicity in media representations. German newspapers construct migrant women as the other in a double sense. Their distinction by cultural difference is combined with a distinction by sex and gender. While current research made us aware of the stereotyped image of migrants as threatening, violent, the gender analysis offers insight into the symbolic construction of the female victim to be seen as a complementary part. So to conclude, journalism, seen as the normative essential of democratic societies, shows, I have to say, fundamental failure in one of its core functions, which is organizing an inclusive discourse in multicultural societies. It's mostly local and tabloid papers that show at least new opportunities for diverse representations. Now I switch to another example. The, super, the top model. The map you see here shows the global distribution of these formats. So all the red covered space is uh, broadcasting local or regional versions of a top model having its original uh, start off uh, in the US. So we do have more than 170 markets all over the world and I just uh, Kicked into some examples, the top model in, in the US having started. Here you see Germany, I come to the picture later on. Um, it's a Serbian version as well, creating national identity in Serbia via this format. We do have the China's uh, top model, I will refer to that, and uh, Mexico has its own, of course, as well. Um, so, as a type of performative reality TV, it shows precisely the making of a woman. Uh, I would argue our academic approach of ethno-methodological understanding of doing gender is here transferred into popular culture, so to say. It is the main plot of the show to make us aware of the need to become a proper woman, a perfect one. Well, here you see the real exact woman to be performed. And this is done by hard work on the performance and on the body. The contrasting selection of different types of candidates ensure, ensures the possibility of diverse forms of femini femininities, though I have to say that all of them represent exceptional forms of beauty, normalized bodies, and standardized performances. And I just give an idea of this standardized setting here from America's top model, and exactly the same way in China's top model, but 
well, you see some cultural, uh, cultural adaptations of how to perform in the, rect, uh, in the right way. Um, I have to hurry a little bit, and so I will argue in, f in three theses how this format somehow governs uh, gender in different culture. The first I would, um, I would label as governing through emotion and affect. Reality TV can be described as an arena of emotions and affect. So bursting into tears seems to be an essential part of each step of becoming a model. When they get their hair cut, when they are voted out, or when they are successful, the candidates always burst into tears. These performances of emotions are editorially signified, slow motion, very close up of the camera, and become a central positioning in the dramatized structure of the show. The models have to learn how to perform emotions in the right way. A specific type of emotional work the sociologist Arli Hochschuld has elaborated in her managed heart. I think some of you are aware of that. As governing through affect, Fortier describes the regime where people regulate each other through emotions and at the same time learn how to regulate themselves. And I think that's what exactly performed here. In such a way, the candidates learn to perform emotions adequately. In the American original, very expressive modes of performing, of crying, outrage are um, uh, well, somehow unnecessary. We observe almost the same type of expressive emotion in Germany. Interestingly, the regulation of emotions to be performed is done by commercial contexts here. The time f uh, for advertisement is sold out excellently in the germ format and it is done globally, that's why it is that popular, mostly limited to high-priced cosmetic industry. While in other casting shows we find offensive forms of defamation and aggression between the candidates, um, a producer of the German show told us in interviews we did, I quote, the candidates are not expected to throw with teacups. This wouldn't fit to our advertisers like My Berlin Yard, uh, well, um, um, industry producing cosmetics for women. If we compare the Chinese version to the American original, the media sociologist Yun Ho Wai has identified strategies of modification to make the expectation of expressive emotional displays work in the Chinese context. We have to know that in 2007, a reality talent show was cancelled for political reasons after one judge burst into tears. Why explains bitter emotions should not be displayed in what is called the Chinese harmonious society. In reaction to this, um, well, repellation of the show, the China's next top model now decided to work these representations of emotion into a new mode which shows them as not authentic as not real the emotion of the candidates but as to be performed as part of the show. So the Chinese candidates have to learn how to perform grief and anger following the rules of a global format. One more please. <laughs> but at the same time the audience is offered a cultural pattern to accept such outbursts not challenging the local emotion rules. Second dimension governing the body. Obviously, the casting show top model is explicitly working on the ideology of the governance of a gendered body, exposing sexualized female bodies in the public sphere. And what you see here is the German host, Heidi Klum, on a poster at a bus stop in Berlin. And we have it all over Berlin right now as the new season has just started. So representing the female body in the public sphere and comparing the bodies as some kind of, well, let's say, human material that needs to be formed by the trainer, but as well by us as spectators, uh, is um, created by the camera. Here you can see the Chinese version. So the camera watching down on them and really showing the material to be performed within the show. 
So the normalization, uniformity, and ultimate formability of the female body is elaborated in many details all over the world. Sexualized women's body become the currency of success in this game of competitiveness. But nevertheless, we show important differences in different cultural con contexts. So the, the extensity in which it is allowed to show the naked body or the almost naked body is quite different. For example, in German, we have the law that candidates who are younger than 18 years old are not allowed to be shown naked. So they uh, decided to, um, to take leaves of roses just to um, have the nipples shaped somehow, making these images even more sexualized in the way they do. So coming to my last dimension, governing the, body, uh, governing the nation. It might sound to you somehow exaggerated to mention the governance of a nation when we talk of such a trash format as a casting show of young girls wanting to become a model. But it is not only the title of a nation, well, China's top model, Germans or the US or Mexico, that is mentioning the nation state. Um, I think these bodies and the, and the final winners become symbolic representatives of the country, echoing historical archetypes we all know of women's bodies representing nation states, La Marianne, here as the allegory of liberty and reason. So the question, which kind of body, which kind of character is finally, finally chosen to represent the nation, reflects, I think, new dimensions of national belonging. The casting show top model is explicitly aware of high mobility, high mo highly mobile cultures, as the model business is something that is performed all over the world and they're traveling within this show. Thus, the expectation of reflecting mobilities, reflecting ethnic and cultural diversity in the set of candidates seem to be highly, uh, of high relevance. In the US format, racial diversity is claimed to be essential, critically discussed as post-multiculturalism by Lantin and Titley. In Germany, I just have uh, the example here. In Germany, the format tries to follow this line and offers quite high opportunities of visibility for ethnic diversity. This setting is regularly critically discussed by the candidates themselves, stating that, I quote, just one of our type will be successful. And type is referring to uh, the color of their skin. Just one brown girl might, um, might be successful. So, my final sentence. Rada Hector has, has argued with the transnational circulation of media images, the hegemony of the West is reproduced in the global imagery as a site of progressive sexual politics and cosmopolitan modernity. We've seen in the case of Top Model that the commodification of this type of cosmopolitan modernity is explicit here. But I would argue, while in journalism we show mostly invisibility or modes of victimization, popular formats like Top Model offer at least material of controversial modes of discussing visibility in popular culture. Thank you. Bueno, continuamos rápido porque mmm, el problema es que iniciamos tarde y después viene la pausa, la comida y nos, se nos acaba el tiempo para, para preguntas y discusión. Claro, claro, pero te quiero presentar primero. Bueno, María Anne Braik eh, realizó estudios de ciencias económicas, sociología y pedagogía en economía en la Universidad Libre de Berlín, así como antropología e historia en la UNAM. En 1989 se doctoró en Sociología en la Freie Universität y eh, pues eh, es en esta misma universidad catedrática en Ciencia Política. Está en el Instituto de Estudios Latinoamericanos. Eh, ella ha hecho trabajos eh, eh, sobre muchísimos temas y aquí tengo un montón de información que me la voy a brincar eh, para que tenga más tiempo para exponer eh, sus tesis. Gracias.
Pues muchísimas gracias. Voy a hablar en español porque aquí me siento en mi casa y quiero agradecer primero a todos de ustedes por participar en este evento y estoy muy uh, orgullosa y muy honrada que uh, primero el PM aceptó este experimento porque sí, cuando se fundó el PM yo estaba aquí estudiando mi doctorado y uh, las colegas siempre me apoyaron y está una de mis maestras que admiro mucho, Brigida. Muchísimas gracias a ustedes que están aquí. Bueno, les invito de veras a un experimento, porque no voy a hablar sobre mujeres y hombres, pero sí voy a tratar de hablar sobre la formación del occidente, resultado de transformaciones materiales y simbólicos, eh, en lo cual se formó la otredad, porque ya los dos hablaron de la otredad. ¿Se ¿Sí puede? Sí, ok. Um, y que yo pienso que la perspectiva feminista, algunos de ustedes se aguardan a Simón Bolívar, que en, a, 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 Bouvard, a Simón Bouvard, que en, a Simón Bouvard, que introdució la otredad a la discusión. ¿Mm? Y después los postcolonialistas tomaron esta idea. Entonces voy a tratar de seguir a esta herencia para pensar la formación del occidente uh, en, tres, en cuatro etapas. Primero, la, forma, la transformación mat, de, mat, materiales, la segunda, eh, la transformación eh, simbólica, la creación de, de un nuevo, nuevo orden eh, simbólico, tercera, América Latina como parte del mundo occidental, y el ultim, la última parte, que a la ya sí voy a regresar al género y a los que dijeron mis colegas, la cuarta es la herencia de un occidente entrelazado, la creación de la juventud. Y nos voy a comenzar um, a mi, con mi experimento. Mira, estas uh, formas de colonización uh, que sí formaron la relación Europa de América Latina, ya más que de 500 años, lo sabemos, se han cambiado varias veces. Unas veces fueron más intensos, otras veces menos intensos. Pero siempre había dos constantes en esta relación Europa-América Latina. La primera era... Siempre había un involucramiento de otras regiones a esta, a región, a esta relación América Latina-Europa. Siempre estaban in in eh, involucradas otras regiones, por ejemplo China, desde el inicio. Hemos olvidado eso. Segundo, en esta relación se construyó la otra edad. Porque en este involucramiento, en esta interrelación, se producían diferencias brutales, en lo cual siempre el hombre blanco no aceptó a los demás como iguales. Entonces, esos son los dos constantes. Entonces, la primera cosa es la transformación material como de esta relación. Y clave en, esa, clave en esta transformación eh, eh, materiales, eh, transformaciones tra eh, materiales eh, son los vínculos eh, que vincularon las tres regiones, América Latina, Europa y Asia. Y había una, un producto, una mercancía fundamental, la plata. Esta materia prima, mineral, destaca destaca en América Latina por su doble calidad, siendo commodity, mercancía, y al mismo tiempo dinero. Fue la plata que hizo posible que Europa modificaba su la plata de América Latina, que uh, modificaba la posición económica de Europa frente a otras regiones del mundo, sobre todo frente a Asia. Tras el, tras el descubrimiento de las grandes minas, la plata fue la produ el producto a través del cual se impulsó el desarrollo de comercio mundial hacia Europa. Los yacimientos con el mineral precioso de mayor calidad en el mundo fueron localizados en Potosí y en México. En ambos sitios se hizo uso por, la, por el mercurio de Europa, que es una cosa que no tiene ningún sentido, y con el trabajo de forzado de la población indígena se produjeron este plata ex, que, que, que logró después cambiar el mundo. Justo en la historia de este material precioso se hace visible eh, especialmente las formas tempranas de la globalización, donde se convierte la plata que fue obtenida Uh, 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 donde fue la plata uh, el, la llave central para Europa para controlar otras partes, sobre todo uh, las partes de, de Asia. Para las, casa, las casas comer, de comercio y para los estados europeos fue especialmente uh, 
la plata les permitía compensar sus desventajas financieras frente a Asia. Porque los europeos no estuvieron interesados en, 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 en América Latina, ¿no? ni pensaron, pensaron que estaban en India. Les permitía, pero esta plata les permitía dar un, una especie de rodeo que consistía per, per, primeramente en obtener un acceso independientemente del Imperio Otomano a las mercancías asiáticas, la seda, que era muy importante para la moda, el algodón, que era fundamental para cambiar el estilo de vida en Europa, y otras especies. Entonces, sí se hizo un cambio fundamental uh, uh, por, estos, por este plata que sí ser, sirvió para los europeos como llave para la, de las riquezas de Asia. Con la demanda, pero la cosa era por qué los chinos necesitaban plata. Esa es la, la gran pregunta, porque con la, la demanda creciente en la misma China, eso era fundamental, producir, producidos por cambios políticos fiscales en la misma China, porque... La, la, los políticos fiscales de China obligaron a, los, a sus comerciantes, artesanos y campesinos a pagar sus impuestos en plata. Entonces se dio un aumento masivo de la demanda de plata como medio de, de pago local en China y a su vez tuvo efectos evidentes en la demanda global, controlado por los coloniales europeos. Entonces, sí, eso, estos dos procesos, en China y en Europa, pero sí con la paz en, en América Latina, eh, tenían como resultado que entre los tres siglos, entre 1500 y 1800, llegaron más o menos tres cuartos, tres cuartos de la producción de plata de nuevo, del Nuevo Mundo a China, por supuesto controlado por los europeos. Primero los españoles y después los ingleses que robaron, el, ustedes se acuerdan de esta cosa. Eso me parece un punto clave de vincular una historia invisible para los europeos y para los, la gente de América Latina, vincularlos y cambiar el estilo de, de vida eh, en Europa, fundamental. Segundo, la transformación, eh, las transformaciones que crearon un nuevo, un nuevo orden simbólico. Porque sí estoy cortando mi ponencia, que ellos tienen. Las transformaciones que, eh, que crearon un nuevo uh, orden simbólico están vinculadas con un cruce de relaciones de desigualdades, lo cual se deja observar en, las, en, en los circuitos de otro commodity, el azúcar. Con el establecimiento de, la, de, las, de las plantillas de la caña de azúcar proveni, proveniente de Asia, se, modificaba, se modificaron tanto las formas de vida como la producción agrícola de millones de personas en América Latina y en las Américas, porque también en el norte. Aún de estos se produjeron impactos masivos en la estratificación social de las Américas a través de los 11 millones de personas de África transformados en esclavos en las colonias americanas. Para la transformación simbólica era central el seguimiento de conceptos y representaciones basados en diversos grados de ser humano o de la humanidad de, los, de las personas. Estas representaciones legitimaron la esclavitud y la división de seres humanos en razas a través de ideologías como, las pobreza, como la pobreza de sangre en el tiempo de, 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 de colonia, igualmente racista que sexista y y tiempo más, más tarde, eh, por el racismo científico, a partir de los, del siglo XIX y XX, con sus catástrofes que conocemos en la Alemania, era eh, uno de los líderes en, este, en esos catástrofes. El nuevo orden simbólico se basa en una, escuela, en una escala de representación que ubica los diferentes grados de, de ser humano, dentro de lo cual el hombre blanco ocupa la, la cúspida y él era que otorgaba el resto de seres humanos, los otros. Tú ya mencionaste la otra edad, allá se construye el otro, los otros, y que tienen un lugar en la jerarquía según la decisión y la legitimación del hombre blanco. La población indígena del nuevo, del nuevo mundo fue comprendido bajo este punto de vista como niños, los, con los que, que había, como las mujeres también, también eran niñas, con las cuales había que hacer misiones o, o educarlas, y a los africanos como seres sin alma y así considerables como predestinados para la esclavitud. En el marco de tal pensamiento racista, 
eh, y también sexista, no era in in inteligible que los colonizados pudieran tener ideas y perspectivas propias que pudieran tener algún tipo de influencia en Europa. Era impensable para los europeos que estos subalternos podrían ser parte de ellos, podrían ser parte de, de su cultura. Y algo que quedaba completamente afuera de este mundo, esta idea que los colonizadores mismos, colonizadores mismos podían liberarse, podían hablar y podían cambiar el mundo. Entonces, sí, para los colonizadores era impensable la revolución de Haití. Ellos todavía piensan que la esclavitud se, 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 se terminó con la abolización, abolización en 1834. Luego la revolución de Haití tenía 30 años más antes y ellos sí terminaban con la esclavitud. Entonces sí, hay una, una idea, en la, hay un vacío en las ideas europeas que no se pueden imaginar que hay, hay movimientos propios de los mismos colonizados. Aún como ya he mencionado anteriormente, regiones en Asia ya habían estado en contacto desde el periodo, el periodo de la colonia, cuando se registraron algunos habitantes asiáticos en México, los entrelazamientos por flujos de personas entre Asia y América Latina comienzan más tarde. La inmigración desde Asia había sido realmente significado sola desde hace el siglo XIX. Con el comercio de trabajadores chinos emergieron en la era de la emancipación de la esclavitud otros imaginarios raciales como los culíes. Integraron los asiáticos, esta imagen de colis, colis, integraron los asiáticos como raza degradada en este orden simbólico europeo. Entonces, cuando, cuando comenzó la discusión sobre la esclavitud, ya entra otro grupo en, el, en la estructuración del orden simbólico racista europeo, que son los eh, eh, emigrados eh, de fuerza de Asia, China, Japón, sobre todo. Bueno, el tercer punto de mi acercamiento a las relaciones y la, a, la, a la construcción del occidente es América Latina como una parte del mundo occidental. ¿Estoy bien? Lo necesito. Hasta el día de hoy, los, los europeos y sus ciencias, ciencias sociales, sus conocimientos, sus, su producción de conocimiento, tienen problemas de reconocer el otro como actor de su propia historia, de su propio destino y, de, y también de, de formación de, de, de sí misma, del europeo mismo, del mundo occidental. Eso se puede ver muy claramente, como ya lo he, lo he mencionado, en la revolución haitiana, pero también se ve en la recepción de los movimientos de independencia y en los mismos actores de la independencia del siglo XIX y XX en, en América Latina. Son movimientos independistas de, de, de los liberales, también pueden ser conservadores católicos, artesanos, el clero progresista o no, tanto intelectuales, pero actores que son conocidos para los europeos, que son cerca, cerca a ellos, que los pueden integrar en su propio imaginario como yo. Y por lo menos... Uh, y entonces, y en este caso excepcional, aceptan que sí hay un movimiento en otras partes, de, de otro, en otras regiones, pero sí siempre que sea cerca de ellos. Entonces, la, en la discusión académica eh, que surgió alrededor de estos, de estos movimientos, se habla de los primeros impulsos rusullanos eh, que se perciben como en el subcontinente como una caja de resonancias de las revoluciones y de las ideas de libertad y de igualdad de Francia, llegando de Francia y de los Estados Unidos pero solamente relacionado con estos actores conocidos. Del, del éxito de este tipo de impulso queda excluida la mayoría de la población, que no es tema de este, de este pensamiento de los impulsos rusianos. Ciertamente las élites de, la, de las repúblicas mismas reforzaron y transformaron las exclusiones coloniales, las asimetrías y las desigualdades, ya que más allá de las diferencias políticas entre liberales y conservadores, coinciden la polarización fundamental de sus pensamientos. Eso es contra la propia población indígena o afrodescendientes en América Latina, pero también contra los eh, eh, migrantes, eh, eh, migrantes de, de Asia, contra los chinos y los eh, japoneses, sobre todo en, 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 los, en, en Perú. 
donde sí a, a, hicieron miles de, de leyes para manejar este, este, este tipo de raza. La élite latinoamericana que, que se rebelaban contra España forjaron un dualismo constitutivo y que se autoconsideraban auto parte de la civilización europea. Entonces, ellos sí se inscribieron en el occidente. En un, se, 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 se sentían como parte de, de, de europeo en un, po, y, en, en un polo se, y, y que se distingue del, 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 del otro, de, de, denominado por, de la, como la barbarie, la barbarie. Ustedes to, todos conocen esta contradicción, civilización y barbarie. Es exactamente esta producción del otro dentro de la misma, del mismo territorio ya independiente. Este, a esta pertenencia, los que fueron convertidos en el otro, mujeres, indígenas, antiguos esclavos, culíes, asiáticos, pero también eh, gente sin tierra, campesinos, trabajadores, lo cual trajo consigo una estigmatización, sexismo, racismo y sobre todo la naturalización de la desigualdad. Esas fungieron como criterios de exclusión social de largo, de largo alcance, ya que es a partir de esta división donde se fundamentan las causas que hasta hoy día hace de América Latina un continente bastante desigual en comparación con el mismo Europa. Sí, hay nuevos mo momentos rusoyanos, por supuesto, eh, más tarde en, los, en el tiempo del, del, del populismo, en los años 30 y 40, que tiene que ver con, con política social y también con la ampliación del, de los, del derecho de voto. Um, y uno también puede decir, hasta hoy día en los gobiernos de izquierda se puede ver estos momentos rusoyanos que tratan de ampliar el, el, el alcance de estas ideas de la igualdad y de la, de la libertad. Pero um, y si también hay momentos propios de los, de los mismos uh, movimientos de América Latina, no todos tienen y no todos están vinculados o, est o tienen una relación con Europa, pero sí todos tienen una, una influencia uh, en, en, la, en, la, en, la, en, en el cambio también en Europa. Por ejemplo, uh, y eso tiene mucho que ver con los derechos de, de la ciudadanía y de la mujer, es América Latina y sobre todo los países del cono sur, Argentina, que en el en inicio del siglo XX abrieron sus puertas hasta mujeres europeas, por supuesto, sin pasaporte, sin nacionalidad. Eso en, en Europa en este momento no había sido posible. En Europa, entre las, en, por las guerras y entre las guerras, la nación era tan fuerte y, una, y muchas mujeres que perdieron su nacionalidad por migración, por ir... ¡Ay, qué horror! Eso no. Entonces, eso sí hay un punto y hay muchos más puntos en lo cual América Latina ha escrito nuevas ideas de libertad y de ciudadanía desde un, dentro de un concepto del occidente. Sí, voy a mi último punto, la herencia de un occidente entrelazado. Entonces, mi hipótesis es que el occidente... No es Europa solo, no es los Estados Unidos solo. Sí, es un entrelazamiento de diferentes lugares en el mundo donde sí había cambios. Y un momento, entonces la, la última es, la herencia de, de, de este occidente entrelazado es la creación de la juventud. Hay un punto de referencia común um, de todos estos occidentes, o ideas de occidentes, que son los movimientos, el movimiento de 68. ¿Y qué es el movimiento de 68? Es sobre todo movimientos de jóvenes para crear, crear una juventud. Les voy a leer una, una citación, me vas a permitir eso, Marta, por favor, de un colega y amigo de nosotros, Bolívar Echeverría, que él, él exactamente detectó esta interrelación de 68 con la creación de una población etaria que antes no, no estaba así presente. Y yo pienso que esta creación de la juventud en los 50 y 60 es muy importante para todo lo que después pasó con la, las ideas de, la, de cambio de género. Bueno, no voy a citar a... Sí, voy a citar a Oliva. Me vas a regalar un minuto. Bueno, entonces, sí, la, la hipótesis de, de la, la... No, déjame terminar. La hipótesis de, 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 de Oliva Echeverría es exactamente que en el mundo occidental iniciando los Estados Unidos, pasando por Europa, pero también entrando a América Latina y en otras partes que, se, que eran parte de este mundo occidental, sí se formaron una nueva, 
una, una nueva parte de la, de la vida de uno, la juventud. Y esta, él, dice, él dice que esos jóvenes tienen, hicieron una, en, en los 60, una, eran rebeldes, rebeldes sin causa. En eso no estoy de acuerdo con él. Yo pienso que sí, había muchas causas. Y escuchando a Annette, una de las causas eran exactamente la liberación de la mujer, y no solamente de la mujer, liberaron también a los hombres. No tengo fotos, pero si yo les enseño las fotos de las manifestaciones de 68 en todo el mundo, en todo el mundo que había manifestaciones, los jóvenes, los hombres tienen pelos largos, están mal vestidos, las mujeres igual. Entonces había un rompimiento, una, una fisura en la producción de un hábito, de una imagen de ser hombre y de ser mujer. Había también un rompimiento de una idea que nunca hay que hacerse muy temprano. No hay que buscar el matrimonio, ¿cómo es? Casarse, no hay que casarse muy temprano, no hay que tener hijos con 18 años o con 16 años. Había un cambio demográfico a partir de eso, en, comenzando con Europa, pero también en América Latina, que toda una generación de jóvenes, hombres y mujeres, decidieron de vivir, de vivir de otra manera. Y decidieron de, también de enamorarse, de vivir su enamoro hombre y hombre y mujer y mujer. Entonces, había un cambio en esta producción de juventud, una producción subalterna que nos permitió de pensar de otro, de otro mundo eh, las relaciones de género. Y en este, en este, los jóvenes tenían muchísimos movimientos, pero el momento del feminismo era exactamente eso, y después del queer y de, de homosexuales, era exactamente eso que era la causa de rebelión de los jóvenes. Muchas gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias a las eh, tres ponentes, creo que tuvimos eh, eh, pues miradas de distintos ángulos y perspectivas a la problemática de los cambios que se presentan a través de la globalización y cómo inciden eh, a diversos niveles, eh, no solamente en las relaciones de género, sino también en la representación, eh, representaciones del género y en la forma de construir eh, la otra edad. Quiero, um, para terminar, agradecerles a todas y, y pues quizás nombrar dos, tres puntos que podemos llevar a las próximas mesas y tenerlos presentes. Creo que salió en la discusión dos dimensiones que son importantes, que reflexionemos y que van a seguir siendo tema. Una, la cuestión del metodológica y teórica de los estudios de género y cómo se aproximan a ciertos problemas que son importantes y que reflexionemos un poco cómo los estudios de género pasaron de estudios de la mujer a estudios de género y cómo ahora está el paradigma de la diversidad o la interseccionalidad tomando fuerza. Y aquí apareció en esta mesa, eh, la eh, Margaret Lunenburg trabaja una visión más interseccional de, de la categoría de género y como se está debatiendo ahorita en, Euro, en Europa, y en el caso de Annette Hitner también hay una visión de los estudios de género que los ve más como relaciones y no como analizar a mujeres exclusivamente. Y yo creo que también Mariana cerró aquí muy bien planteando eso, de cómo estamos trabajando sobre construcciones, pero que no solo son de mujeres ya, sino que son más complejas y pensamos en, eh, partiendo de Judith Butler, en cómo eh, ya tenemos que hablar de una pluralidad de entidades eh, sexuales o de género. El otro problema que veo y que es muy importante es que concierne un poco a nuestra actividad de académicos y científicos y de investigadores y es precisamente que en la discusión salió un poco el alcance que tienen las tesis que nosotros formulamos partiendo de dos cosas, uno, una investigación empírica y otra, del lugar que nos ha formado como científicos teórica y metodológicamente y que nos hace dar una mirada a eso. Y creo que es muy interesante ver que la forma de la que hay tres culturas, cuatro culturas científicas que están aquí hoy eh, discutiendo y que quizás hay momentos en que hay que hacerlas visible y ponerlas a, a dialogar, porque creo que así se da una circulación de… De, no solo de conocimiento, sino de diálogo en estas culturas científicas y avanzamos más en, en la investigación y en la forma de aproximarnos a los problemas. Entonces, creo que esos son temas que quizás vamos a seguir eh, tematizando en las otras mesas desde diferentes perspectivas. Muchísimas gracias a todos.